Hello and good afternoon. My name is Ophir, and I hunt wildlife traffickers. I'm the founder of Eagle, a community of activists in the forefront of fighting wildlife crime in Africa. Every day we have one major wildlife trafficker arrested and put in prison. And I want to share with you my journey to this adventure, to this cause, and ask you to take part of it. I think that animals have the power to transform us. They touch our hearts, they light passion in us. Sometimes they can even make us better human beings. And this is the animal that transformed me, a baby chimp named Kita. I rescued her and managed to get her trafficker into jail. In fact, her trafficker got the honor to become the first ever trafficker to get to jail in all of Central and West Africa. So I became a father and mother to Kita. And every baby chimp is special. And Kita was special in that she loved tickling. So every morning she would drag me by the hand and take me to bed and throw herself to bed to be tickled. And, and chimps have a special laugh, and you can, you can listen to her special laugh, like <laughs> <laughs> And when yeah. I had enough of it, yeah. and Kita would yeah. never have enough of tickling, I would try to go, Kita would always grab me by the hand and take me back to bed again to get more tickling. Oh and since Kita never had enough, oh, that would go every morning for seven or eight times, until I had enough. Listen to her laugh. And if I made the error of uh, waking up too late and Kita would wake up before me, she would run to the kitchen and try to make her own feeding bottle. So she would open the baby milk powder and scoop it out and try to put it inside the bottle and shake it up and put some water in it uh, and make one big mess out of my kitchen. Here she's asking for food. And when Kita was not on my back, she was playing with neighbors' kids or, or maybe harassing their dog. She always loved to run after the dog and touch him by the tail. And, and little Nicole here, uh, she was coming to me so many times crying, saying that Kita was stealing one of her toys. And then I would have to, then I would have to go and, uh, uh, then I would have to go and, uh, and try to convince Kita to give back the toy and give it to Nicole and make peace between the both to be friends again. And that was my life, and this was uh, the animal that transformed me. But the story begins a little bit earlier in the rainforests of, Cam rain rainforests of Central Africa. As I arrived Cameroon in Central Africa, I was already an, um, uh, an adventurer turning into an activist. I was just roaming the continent trying to, to make a small difference. And I was touched by these creatures and I wanted to write about uh, the extinction of great apes. I went after, as, as a journalist, and I went after the words of Jen Goodall, that in 20 years we're going to lose these magnificent creatures because of the illegal trade in their meat and their babies. The meat is considered, ape meat is considered something exclusive, like a status symbol, sort of like the caviar of Central Africa. And I, uh, um, and I wanted to direct the public to the good efforts, good conservation efforts, trying to fight against this dark prophecy that they will disappear. And arriving in Cameroon, it was very easy to see the dire consequences of this illegal trade. Um, it, was, uh, it was organized and it was professional, um, and it was not rooted in poverty, but in the rich and the powerful, as most of what you see here was ordered by high officials like ministers and colonels. And, um, uh, and, and the same people who are entrusted to protect these animals, uh, wildlife officers and, and the police officers, were the same ones that ran the trade and were the biggest traffickers. This crate you see here was used to transport six baby chimps like Kita at a time, and fetching a dozen of thousands of dollars to its trafficker for each chimp. Uh, but there was a law, and that law was given a maximum of three years imprisonment to anybody even touching a baby chimp. So as a journalist, I was asking myself, so how many times was this law applied? How many wildlife traffickers were actually getting to jail? And the answer was zero. One big zero. Zero wildlife prosecutions, zero traffickers behind bars. 
And it was a very clear indi indicator to a failure. But not just a failure of corrupt African governments, it was also a conservation failure. You see, most of my article this time was already written. There is a race towards extinction, there is illegal trade, there is a law but it's not applied, there is corruption. I was looking for a happy ending for my article. I was looking for that light in the end of the tunnel. So I was directed to the NGO world, conservation world. But instead of a solution, I found a far bigger problem. Because conservation NGOs took themselves as a business, a mere business. And they were not really adapting to the conservation challenges in front of them. So it was business, and it was as usual. Corruption has been identified as number one obstacle for conservation objectives. And yet, when I was interviewing conservation officials, they were not even able to pronounce the word corruption. In fact, they themselves were fueling corruption. And like any other sector in the country, they were also plagued with corruption. So I was angry and, and, and frustrated, and I left the capital in research. And I, re I, I reached a rural town, and the people there were very direct. They told me, yeah, yeah, we, we sell chimp meat over here, and we sell gorilla hens over there, and we also have live ones. Now, what, what, what did they mean by live ones? You see, when a poacher is killing an ape, he is ending up killing a family of apes, because they, they protect each other. And a mother that would be shot would have a baby on her back, up to three years old of that baby. So her body will fall from the tree, dead. And the baby, helpless, just like a human baby, will not run away, will just cling to the mother's body and cry. So the poacher can, can hold the baby by the hand and say, well, there's not much meat on this baby, so maybe I can kill it now and try to sell it in the market, but, but maybe I will try my luck in the pet trade. And that's what I had in front of me, an orphaned baby chimp, a survivor of the slaughter of his entire family. And the traffickers were, uh, and the, the baby was sick, and the traffickers were abusing him. And uh, his emotional world, the emotional world of such a highly sensitive being, was just locked. Babies like this, they are not just in need of water and, and, and food, they are in need of love. Baby gorillas, without love, they just snap and die. Baby chimps, they try to shut down their emotions and they can survive a little bit more, but living on borrowed time. And they tried to sell him to me for less than $100, which of course I wouldn't pay, because if I pay that, it will just send them back to the forest, killing more apes, and thinking there is more demand for these baby chimps. So I went to the authorities, but the authorities wouldn't help. They were just asking for bribes. They were not interested in doing their jobs or applying the law. And after a long discussion and arguments, they actually tried to sell me another baby chimp. That's how corrupt they were. So again, I'm angry and frustrated, and, and, and I'm going back to my motel room. And I, I just couldn't sleep. Because I, I kept on thinking of this baby chimp that would die soon. But if I save him, will actually outlive me. So my, my frustration from conservation now had a face, and this face, it was haunting me. So I stayed up all night and started writing my anger on a piece of paper, all the criticism and everything that is bad in the system. I started writing an outline for an NGO that would be different from what I criticized. An organization that would be based on local activism, had a hands-on approach, and fight corruption to get the law applied. An outfit that will have undercover agents that will infiltrate the trade, those criminal networks, and find those kingpins and, and, and corrupt officials. Then control the arrest operations and the corruption within the police to make sure that these guys are actually arrested. And afterwards, uh, lawyers and legal advisors that will follow up these cases in court and fight the bribing attempts of the magistrates. And I wrote all this um, under the banner New Generation Non-Governmental Organization because I wanted it to be completely different, opposite of what I saw in the capital. So the following morning, I went back to this baby chimp, and I was, I was determined to rescue him. So I went back there, and I, I took the book of law with me, and I put it on the table of the traffickers, and I said, well, read it. Three years imprisonment. And they look at me, and they look at the book of law, 
and they look at me and they look at the book of law again and then they look at me and they were totally unimpressed. So I said, well, look, I know that this law for you is meaningless because you can bribe your way out of it with what? Three dollars, four dollars? But that's exactly what I'm here for. This is my new job. And I started bluffing them using what I wrote the night before. I'm a part of this big international NGO in the capital. We have a big office and we fight corruption to get the law applied. And the car is coming to take you and the judge is waiting and all my job is to make sure you don't bribe your way out. Now they got hysterical. They started shouting at each other. And I was, I was enjoying it and letting them boil in their juices and did as if I'm talking to an imaginary headquarters. Yeah, they are ready. The judge is waiting. Yeah, two, two hours before the car is coming. Thank you, that's great. And play with it. And after a while, I told them, well, look, if, if you remain my informants and you will tell me more about the bigger criminals activating you, maybe there is something I can do for you. And they were pleading, please, please, please help us. And at this point, I didn't even have to ask for the baby chimp because they just wanted to get rid of him. And the baby chimp was, was tied very tightly on the waist and it gave him some bloody, bloody wounds. And I, when I approached to, to untie him, everybody was afraid because they thought that he would run away because they treated him like a rat and he acted like a rat. So when I untied him from his ropes, I, I just held my arms up and he didn't run away, he just climbed my body up to the chest and gave me one big hug and in a second was transformed from a rat back to a baby again. A baby with needs of emotion, endless needs in love. And I named him Future because that's what I wanted to give him, a future. And this hug became permanent because basically Future was adopting me. So I found myself a father and mother to a baby chimp without really choosing it. Now, in my hand, I had a plan of how to not just give a future to a baby chimp, but how to fight for the future of his species. And so uh, this young guy was forcing me, basically, to stay and live up to my words and try to apply what I was writing. And, and this is a story of how uh, the first wildlife law enforcement NGO in the world was born. And this is a typical picture from those days. Um, I would stay after midnight, continue to work, fight to make this dream into a reality. And Future at this point would already be sleeping on my back. Future was always on me. Even at night, it would just sleep on me on my chest. Some nights, I would just feel his tiny eyeballs moving on my chest fast, and he would wake up from a nightmare. You see, chimps dream, and these orphan baby chimps, they have nightmares from the slaughter of their families. So he would wake up from a nightmare, and he would try to, to, to find something that will soothe him, to try to suck something, and he would give me these hickeys on my neck. <laughs> now, at this time, I was, I was moving from government office to government office, trying to look all serious and dignified. I'm opening an organization, and I would have these embarrassing hickeys on me. And, um, and trying to explain it to the directors and saying, oh, listen, it's not what you're thinking. I'm, I'm sharing my bed with a chimp. I didn't get many points on that one. <laughs> so fast forward, I was joined by Cameroonian activists. And together, we tried to make this happen. We had nothing. We had no car, no office, no equipment, no salaries, no donor, no budget, no nothing. Nothing more than an idea and lots of passion. And we started checking things up. And you remember Kita, the chimp that loved to be tickled? That's how we arrested her trafficker and rescued her. After that, we started attacking ivory traffickers and and arresting them, uh, leopard skin traffickers, lion skin traffickers. And, and then we got to court and we got good prosecutions. We managed to get them to jail so we could climb up. And then we started cracking down on the uh, Chinese connection to the illegal trade, those uh, harder criminal rings. After that, um, we managed to attack corruption. 
get police commissioners to jail, army captains, mayors, governors, uh, politicians, wildlife officials, even NGO officials to jail. We managed to get foreign uh, traffickers to jail, like this uh, Greek uh, director of a logging company that was trafficking apes and parrots, and, and we managed to get him to jail. Um, we managed to attack the uh, trade in illegal, uh, the illegal trade in African grey parrots. It was a criminal pyramid that was fetching to the top about a million dollars per week illegally. And on the top of it, that's the African grey parrots you see here. On the top of it was no other than the deputy minister of wildlife. That's how corruption works. After that, we managed to climb up and get those organized crime outfits of, of, the, of the ivory trade. Um, those criminal syndicates. The container you see here was containing more than 300 elephants ivory in this false compartment concealed. And they were doing this every month or two months for a very long time. So it's one crime family, one organized crime, or one, one criminal organization that was in charge of the slaughter of more than 32,000 elephants. And we managed to crack down on this syndicate. So again, fast forward, um, we managed to, uh, to spread, this, uh, uh, spread this, um, uh, this model, this innovative model. And we are now Eagle, a community of over 100 activists. We have special teams in more than uh, in, in nine countries now, and we keep on expanding. So every day we have an arrest operation, and we get one major uh, wildlife trafficker to jail. We have more than 1,400 major wildlife traffickers uh, that we managed to get to jail up to now. Uh, and what we do today, what we do on a daily basis, is still exactly identical to what I wrote in that night, that crucial night, before uh, I rescued Future. Because for me, activism is an adventure. It is crossing from being an observer to being a participant, participating in shaping our communities, shaping our environment. But maybe the difference between me and the next guy is nothing more than the hug of a baby chimp. Tens of thousands of species are now at risk of extinction. Scientists tell us that we are on the verge of the sixth wave of mass extinction because of us. We cause global warming, we pollute our waters, our air, we plunder our planet from its forests to its oceans. Sometimes it looks like we're on course to destroy anything else but us on this planet. So much bad news. So much bad news we are feeling defeated. But for us in the forefront, when we're confronted with it, we don't feel defeated. We cannot feel defeated. Because we have that optimism that comes from taking a decisive action. So join us. Take a step towards optimism. Take a step towards this adventure. Because animals, nature, has the power to transform us and make us better human beings. But we have the power to change our course. We have the power to shape a better future for us and for nature. Thank you very much.